Ooh, I see the printouts here. Um, so mm -hmm. she said that if you want to when you ask questions, because this is all we have right now, uh -huh. when you get to the question port, you can just put your mask on and go down. Okay. And just great. Perfect. And then I okay. can do the handouts thing if you want me to. Okay. So. Yeah, that would be great. I think we might want to start doing handouts so that we have um, kind of the people. It's one per person. And so when you introduce me, Seth. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so just just so they have some reinforcement if they want to use it. Thank you.
Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> All right. Well, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Simonetta Coquis. She has been with the Transylvania community, family, bubble, whatever you want to call it, uh, since 1997. She's a PhD in French literature from New York University with a specialization in medieval and renaissance literature. And if you've taken a class from her, as many of us have, uh, I'm sure you know that specialization holds true today. Uh, she has a master's in French and Italian literature from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Uh, and she's a bachelor's, if I'm told what I'm told is correct, uh, in international relations and poli-sci, which just goes to show that, one, the sky's the limit with uh, what we can do with our majors, and any of us, despite our majors, can end up being like Dr. Coquis someday. Maybe I'll be that cool if I try really hard. Um, at Transy, she's been a beloved professor of French language classes and Spanish language courses, uh, French literature, medieval French literature, and more. Uh, and as somebody who's had the pleasure of getting to talk to her, uh, she's one of the best conversationalists uh, that I've ever met in my life. Um, and uh, also, because of this, she's going to be taking questions later. And there's a microphone right there. So if you have a question at the end of the lecture, you can just mosey up and form a line behind the mic. And that's how you will be doing questions at the end of the lecture. So uh, without further ado, one of the most beloved and adored members of the transit community, Dr. Simonetta Coquis. Seth, thank you so much. That was exceedingly generous. Oh, well, thank you for coming here this afternoon. I'm so delighted to see you. And um, I'm here today to transport you to another time and to another world, into the story of two mythical lovers, Tristan and Isolt, and to the courtly realm of a 12th century woman, Marie de France, who captured in, in writing a magical moment of their adventure. I will also take you back to Hagen in all safety, um, hoping that your experience in this distant, exotic world will enrich you. Those of you who've studied abroad, and I see that there are several of you here, um, already know the transformative effects of experiencing other cultures, of their ways of living, and other stories. Stories become a part of who we are, and they move us to experience another way of existing. Like the liberal arts, stories open our cognitive channels in unexpected ways. <clears throat> Our trip begins with a tale as old as time about the resilience and the frailty of star-crossed lovers whose lives were marked by their fidelity to love. Society, their life situation, did not allow them to be together, and yet they managed to keep their union strong beyond life itself into eternity. Today, I will recite for you a narrative poem that recounts one small episode of the saga of Tristan and Isolde. We will delve into how the words of this concise, jewel-like poem bring to light enduring themes, beauty, and wisdom. Finally, I will leave you with an invitation. Before we begin, though, let me give you a little bit of context. For those of you who are not familiar with the saga of Tristan and Iso, the plot is really quite simple. Tristan is an orphan, the beloved nephew of King Mark of Cornwall. Mark must wed, but vows only to wed the woman who has the golden hair that a dove had brought to him to land from Ireland beyond the sea. Tristan, his nephew, has many talents and is a great warrior to boot. After slaying the giant Morholt, Tristan brings Isolt of the golden hair to his uncle Mark. But something happens in the voyage across the sea. Tristan and Isolt, thirsty from the heat of the summer, by mistake, drink a magic love potion that was intended to ensure the happy marriage of Mark and Izo. Tristan and Izo are, are henceforth united in a spiritual but also carnal love that transcends the difficulties they encounter. 
Mark eventually learns of their affair and seeks to entrap his nephew and his bride. In the backdrop are the political imperatives of Mark's fledgling kingdom and the need to end the war between Ireland and Cornwall. Mark uncovers proof of their adulterous love and resolves to punish them, but each time the lovers appeal to God and use clever means of seeing each other and escaping punishment. But they risk being discovered at every turn. At one point, Mark plans to hang Tristan and burn Isolt at the stake. Tristan escapes on his way to the execution, makes a miraculous leap from a chapel on a cliff, and rescues Isolt. The lovers escape into the forest of Morois and live there for several years until they are discovered again. Tristan agrees to return Isolt to Mark and leaves Cornwall definitively. He settles in Brittany, where he marries another Isolt, Isolt of the White Hands. Finally, when Tristan is injured in battle, he sends a friend to seek out Isolt of the Golden Hair, the only person who can heal him. Isolt arrives on a ship with white sails, the agreed-upon signal to Tristan that she is on board. However, Tristan's jealous wife tricks him and tells him that the sails are black, signaling that his beloved refused to help him. Tristan dies, despondent, and Isolt also dies of grief when she arrives to find his lifeless body. Mark buries the lovers on opposing sides of a chapel, hoping to separate their bodies, at least in death. However, a hazel tree grows over Tristan's grave and a sunny honeysuckle over Isolt's grave, and the two continue to intertwine no matter, no matter how many times they are cut down. Even just this brief summary gives you a sense of why this story became the greatest hit of the Middle Ages. It, it was written and rewritten in many forms and languages across the European continent, has inspired artworks and musical compositions over the centuries, and still, to this day, is the subject of many art forms, including film. The Tristan and Isolde saga first circulated throughout Europe in oral form and was later written down by several writers, including Thomas of Britain and Beroule, who was French. Likely, minstrels performed it in some form at the court of Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine in the mid-12th century. In the 1170s, Marie de France, a woman writer, heard it. She composed poetic narratives called lays which were also recited, performed aloud, often accompanied by the harp or the rote. They, she heard it, it inspired her to compose a lay about a very small episode in the larger saga. Hers is the only extant written text that relates this particular episode. Here, in my own translation, is Marie de France's lay, Chevrefeuille. I think I'm going to start moving. It is my wish, it pleases me well, to tell you the true lay known as a chevrefeuille, where and how and by whom it was made. Many have recounted it and recited it to me, and I have discovered it in writing about Tristan and the Queen of their love that was so perfect, for which they knew much pain. Then they died of it on the same day. King Mark was furious with Tristan, his nephew, irate. From his lands he banished him because of the queen he loved. He went back home to South Wales, where he was born. A year went by. He could not go back. But then he abandoned himself to death and destruction. Do not be amazed at this, for he who loves loyally is greatly pained and afflicted when he does not have what he desires. 
Tristan, despondent, lost in thought, leaves his country. He goes straight to Cornwall, where the queen is. In the forest, he went alone, so as not to be seen by anyone. In the evenings, he would emerge when the time came to find shelter. With peasants, with humble people, he would spend the night. He would ask for news of the king to know how he was. They tell him that they had heard that the barons had been summoned to Tintagel. They must go, for the king wants to feast with them. At Pentecost, they, um, they are all to be there. There will be much joy and pleasure. And the queen will be there with him. Oh, Tristan heard this. He was elated. She could not pass by there without him seeing her. On the day the king departed, Tristan returned to the forest by the path which he knew the party would take. A hazel branch he cut in half. He worked it to make it square. When he had whittled down the stick, he engraved his name on it. If the queen saw it, and she would be on the lookout, she will surely recognize her lover's staff when she sees it. There were other times before when she had recognized it. This was the essence of the letter he had sent her, that he had been there a long time, had waited and lingered about to spy and to find out how he could see her again, for he could not live without her. So it was with the two of them, as with the honeysuckle, when it attaches to the hazel branch. When it binds to it and winds itself all around the branch, together they can endure. But then, should you want to separate them, the hazel branch dies quickly, and the honeysuckle will do likewise. My beautiful beloved, so it is with us. Not you without me, not me without you. The queen came by on horseback. She looked ahead of her, saw the branch, and recognized it well. She understood all the letters. Oh, the lights who led her, she commanded to stop right away. Oh, she wanted to dismount and rest. They did as she ordered. She went far from her entourage. She called her lady-in-waiting, Bong Yen, who was so faithful. From the road, she went off away in the woods. She found him, whom she loved more than any living thing. Together, they bring great joy. Oh, he spoke to her at his leisure, and she told him everything she pleased. Then she revealed to him that the king will be reconciled with him, that he had been heavy-hearted at having banished him so because of the accusation he had done it. But then she departed. She left her beloved. When the time came to separate, they began to weep. Tristan returned to Wales until his uncle called him back. For the joy he had felt seeing his beloved, to remember the words that he had written as the queen said he should, Tristan, who played the harp well, made with them a new lay. Quite briefly, I will name it. Goat leaf, the English call it. Chevrefeuille is the French name. I have told you the truth of the lay I have recited here. Allow me now to take you a little more deeply into the text of Marie's Chevrefeuille. But we, before we dive in further, a word about the author. We don't know who she was. She tells us in her writings that her name is Marie and that she is 
from France. Hence, with precision, but perhaps not much inventiveness, the 19th century scholars baptized her Marie de of France. Historically, her particularity has been that she's a woman writing in a man's world of letters. However, knowing whom she hung out with in this ebullient 12th century when new political boundaries were being drawn and the French language is colliding and becoming rich with echoes of other tongues and other cultures, we might know something of her spirit. Most likely, Marie lived at the court of the queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine, a progressive and bold monarch who brought with her to England her books and the passionate art of the troubadours. She also brought the more liberal ideologies from her lands in the south of France concerning the equal standing of women in society and in love. It was quite a time, and Marie culled the best of this whirlwind of ideas and stories. She crafted her own collection of lays in her tightly knit and highly economical octosyllabic verse. Her delight in hearing and then retelling these stories is her spark for creativity. Now, the text and a few notions of what it might suggest for us. I will ask you here to refer to the page in the handout with the Anglo-Norman text of Chevrefeuille. I will be indicating the line numbers for your reference. Marie starts out her lay by highlighting the pleasure and purpose of storytelling, and this is verse 3. Que la vérité vous en compte. Vérité, from veritas, truth. Marie reveals the truth. There is truth, there are forms of knowing that require our understanding, our active input to bring them to, li to life. In the prologue to her lays, in fact, and this is also quoted at the very top of the handout there in Anglo-Norman, she asks her readers to, quote, Gloser la lettre et de l'oursen le surplus maître. To explain, interpret the text, and add their own knowledge and wisdom, l'oursen, to the fullness of its meaning. For Marie, the truth takes many forms. First and foremost, it emerges from her interpretation, from her artistic creation. She takes an existing story and shapes it into a new form through the lens of her poetic voice. For her, the truth is not just her craft as, as a poet, though, but also her enlightened fidelity to what she had originally heard and read to what was known and shared by others. As Professor Gary Deaton told me when we were talking about this text not too long ago, in a world that desperately needs quality ideas, ideas require a synergistic combination of identity and authenticity. Marie's identity as a woman in the most brilliant court of Europe in those days shapes the focus of her story, of what she sees as true in the larger story. She remains faithful, authentic to the overarching saga while zeroing in in what she sees as the core of the lover's very being, the emotional, life-giving, and joyous meeting in the forest. Very succinctly, Marie then sets the stage for the encounter between the lovers. Marie, the narrator, quickly relates the situation from Tristan's perspective. He has been banished, exiled, isolated. He is not the agent of his situation, but the recipient of Mark's anger. And the situation is intolerable. And here I will refer to verses 19 and 20 on the handout. Miss Peace. Ce mist en abandonne de morte 
et de destruction. But then he abandoned himself to death and destruction. His life had become unlivable. In, <coughs> excuse me, in their very recent book, Le Vivable et l'Invivable, The Livable and the Unlivable, Judith Butler and Frédéric Worms speak about the unlivable as the furthest extreme of suffering and injustice. At the core of knowing what is unlivable is perhaps a greater understanding of what it is that makes life livable and distinguishes it from mere survival. For Tristan, the injustice of the banishment and the suffering of his separation from his beloved made him unable to continue in exile. His actions, albeit destructive, dislodged him from his unlivable situation and brought him into the livable. Indeed, Tristan's self-destructive quest marks a turning point, supported by Marie's direct address to her readers, to her listeners. Ne vous en merveillez niente. Do not be amazed at this. Car s'il qui aime loyalement, for he who loves loyally, moult est dolence et responsets is greatly pained and afflicted in the social structure of the medieval world, where marriages were arranged and often loveless, the courtly love that Marie de France brings to light here, s'il qui aime loyalement, is the true, loyal love that is legitimate which is why God is always on the side of the lovers who keep faith and remain true to their volontets, their will, their desire to be together. Indeed, Marie's direct address and affirmation of his predicament heralds Tristan's movement into action. On, and here I will be quoting verses 27 and 28. On Cornoaille veit tut dreit, la ou la reina manait. He goes straight to Cornwall, where the queen is. He crosses the boundary into the prohibited land. It is in this unwelcoming, dangerous territory that Tristan enters a liminal space. And here I will quote verses 29 and 30 to 32. En la forest, tout seul se mist. In the forest, he went alone. Ne voulait pas que me le veist, so as not to be seen by anyone. En la vespere sonne sait. In the evenings, he would emerge, quand dans de herbergier estate when the time came to find shelter. The forest is dangerous in the Middle Ages, but also full of mystery and potential. This liminal space holds the possibility for transformation, for a return to society. In the forest, it is Tristan's solitude that is transformative, his ability to live simply and his humility. Please look at verses 33 and 34. Od paysans, od pauvre gent, pernait la nuit herbergement. With peasants, with humble people, he would spend the night. It is this that allows for the opening, the news of where and how he might be able to see Isolt. Then it is his ability to write that moves the story forward and brings about the encounter. Well, as an academic and a writer myself, I had always been enthralled with the multiple references to writing in this lay. Tristan writes on a hazel branch as a sign for the queen that he is close by. Tristan had written a letter to her confirming his undying love by comparing their relationship to the synergistic entwining of the hazel branch and the honeysuckle. 
And finally, Marie tells us that Tristan himself wrote down the words to the lay as the queen had instructed him to do. I saw these multiple references to the craft of writing as a way for Marie to point us to its literary qualities, to underscore the central metaphor of the lay, which is very powerfully stated in Tristan's own voice. And here I will invite you, oops, I did not write those verse numbers, but it is 77 and 78. Belle amie, si est de nous, my beautiful beloved, so it is with us. Ne vous sans me, ne je sans vous. Not you without me, not me without you. The direct comparison of the hazel branch entwined with the honeysuckle as symbolic of the lover's unbreakable bond in the very words of the story's hero were compelling enough for me. So when I began performing the narrative lays, Chevrefeuille was my first. I performed it as a true scholar actor. In 2005, at the Kentucky Foreign Language Conference, I followed what many liter literary critics who I focused on and who were saying that writing was top and foremost. So I magnified the centrality of the metaphor. I considered it to be the core of the lay, the trigger for the encounter between the lovers in the woods. The encounter itself almost seemed to have a minor importance, almost a letdown. Well, this all changed when I was invited to perform a Chevrefeuille again, this time at Barnard College in New York City in 2015, for a digital humanities project on Marie de France. I asked one of my, t my students, Chloe Bingham, to direct me in the performance. Her insightful questions and her knowledge of stagecraft redirected my thinking entirely. By shedding light on the empty spaces in the text, the unspoken, unwritten actions that undergird the unfolding of the narrative, the emotional core of the lay came into focus for me. Let me explain. Aristotle says that performance should allow an audience to see, to experience actions taking place before their eyes. Part of the actions that a storyteller performs are the emotions of the characters. How does an actor storyteller show make emotions manifest? In order for them to be performed, to be action, they need to progress. They have to be dynamic, not static. Emotional development follows a similar path to the traditional progression of a plot, exposition, conflict, climax, denouement. Characters' emotions follow a similar trajectory. There has to be some kind of mounting emotional tension that eventually reaches its peak and is resolved. Therefore, I came to realize that the metaphor of the hazel branch entwined with the honeysuckle might be of great interest to academics, but that it is not necessarily the emotional core of the lay. The climax of the lay is going to be where there is also action. Indeed, the emotions, the actions intensify well after this metaphor. The intensity builds because the queen comes in and she's excited about seeing the hazel branch in the woods. She is on the lookout yet has, her demeanor has to be very queenly, and there is danger. She needs to distance herself from her knights and her retinue, so she has to quickly come up with a pretense for stopping. Every second counts, and her excitement and fear must be palpable. She needs to get far enough away from her people to create a safe space for them to meet. And then it happens. Please look at verses 92 and 93. 
de dans le bois, celui trouva que plus à mort que rien vivant. In the woods, she found him, whom she loved more than any living thing. The emotional climax is here when she finally sees Tristan in the woods. For that moment, for the instant in which their eyes meet, there are no words, just an empty space. This is when the tension reaches its apex and can finally be released in the palpable presence of the lover's encounter. And here, please look at verse 94. Entre elles, men and joya, mult grand. Together, they bring great joy. Notice the present tense of the Anglo-Norman, manent, to bring out, to put forward, to show. In Anglo-Norman, the use of the present tense in a story narrated in the past is not jarring. It brings the action to the present as a way of highlighting it, of infusing it with the intensity of the present moment. The joya that the lovers share is rich with meaning, with the completeness of their relationship. Theirs is intimacy in the fullest sense, the sharing and the bringing forth of complete joy when they are together. Well, it makes sense now that this is the apex because this moment is the embodiment of the metaphor of Tristan's earlier aha moment. This instant is so full, so emotionally charged that words would not be sufficient. This is an example of an empty space that performance brings out in order for the story to pro progress, to reach its conclusion. The denouement, when the lovers are together and can finally talk and plan their future, happens very quickly. Here, Marie's narrative becomes economical and speeds forward in order to return to the beginning. Marie as narrator returns. She tells us that Tristan knows how to perform well. Verse 112. Qui bien savait arper, who played the harp well. He writes the lay. And the story is done. The lay ends expeditiously. Now, let us return to Transylvania and to Hagen Auditorium. When I received an email from Kim, Kim Njokas indicating that the seniors had selected me to give the last lecture, well, after the first tears of gratitude and disbelief, and um, after the inevitable moment of complete panic, what could I possibly have to say? <laughs> I said to myself that I want to share with you something that I love and something that has inspired me to cross boundaries and to go beyond my comfort level. After thinking of many other texts, I always came back to Chevrefeuille. And now I would like to share with you some of the things that I love about Marie's Lay and what I think they suggest to me and perhaps to us. How Tristan in the lay comes to a profound awareness of the untenable, unlivable condition of his life in exile. Banishment is the harshest of punishments, worse than death. The injustice of his predicament, of his metaphorical imprisonment in isolation, is the first step in transforming his situation. Taking the important step of crossing the boundary into Cornwall set everything into motion. However, like in our own lives, moving into a new life and a new space requires reflection and introspection. Entering the forest alone. The liminal space Tristan encounters is rich with possibilities, 
also with dangers, but his attentiveness to the signs, to the opportunities, leads him to see his beloved. Oh, how in the encounter of the lovers in the forest, the core is the present moment and the freedom to talk and be themselves. The authenticity they bring to the relationship is paramount. The interpersonal here goes beyond the passion they also share to a space of real and shared intimacy and connectedness. That experience alone, lived in the present, is eternal. This contrasts profoundly with how the media now often trivializes love, makes it material or trite or a subject of cynicism. Marie's lovers point to the fullness of our human potential for deep, meaningful love in all our relationships, not just the amorous. How Marie articulates, she voices her truth, her vision, gives shape to a well-known story, highlighting, putting in the spotlight what she sees is central to the story. For me, then, performance is sort of meta-practice, a means of foregrounding, of uncovering and embodying what her text suggests. Not that what I choose to perform or to foreground is the only truth. Rather, as David Salt says in Texts in Action, Action in Texts, quote, a performance brings out not just a single set of actions that the text requires, but a range of potential actions that the text might suggest, allow, or provoke. Marie's story may set the parameters for the performance, but my human presence, my vision, brings added value. As Marie said, we should do de l'oursen le surplus maître, add their own knowledge and wisdom to the fullness of its meaning. Interpretation in its many forms, linguistic, literary, and performance-based, or scientific, historical, etc., is at the core of our experience here of the liberal arts. We contribute the light of our understanding. Indeed, in a world where truth is intersubjectively determined, there is still room for our own subjective truth, including action. We bring not just our knowledge, but also our past and our anticipation of the future to everything we do, to everything we respond to. Marie's careful attention to word choice, to the ramifications and the resonance of the words in her lays, are in some ways a model of richness simplicity, and beauty. Marie's attention to words, her fertile succinctness, inspires me. In a similar way to what Marie did after hearing the story of Tristan and Isolde, crafting her own poem to highlight her vision of the beauty of the eternal lover's story, I also crossed an uncomfortable boundary and wrote a poem on a chevrefeuille myself. I would like to share it with you now. And this is also on the handout on the English side. Chevrefeuille. He wrote the word etched in wood thoughtfully. The word we never spoke. We did not know it yet. But he knew it would light in me a memory buried in the still of my soul, not the burning, not the cherishing, nor the laughter, not even the pain, but the silence of our eternal embrace. So now, I leave you with an invitation to go forward boldly to pursue your path of love and creativity, 
rich with the experiences of the liberal arts, and go forward with courage and authenticity. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and now we do have some time for questions. And I gather that we have a microphone right here, so if you do have a question, just step up and, and ask. Allons-y. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yes, good. Um, yeah, I have a question that references maybe the, the first half of, of, of the lecture. Yes. It was the part where you were talking about identity. Um, mm -hmm. I've had some conversations in the past with, like, you know, Dr. Kaufman about, you know, the, the sense of self that you find in Greek, you know, in, in ancient Greek and writing and in language. What's sort of the Anglo-Norman sense of identity? You know, what's, what's, the, what's the development of that idea in that era of history? You know, because it's, I mean, it's not what we have today, but it's something, uh, that, that's interesting to me, what that starts as and what that develops into. Right. And what, what I think, uh, really, Marie is putting into action in her lays is what is happening in her world right then and there. Um, because uh, on, on one hand, the, the, the society is so hierarchical, so structured, that people either fit one category or another, but have no way of entering that liminal space of finding something that's different, uh, finding potential. And particularly as a woman writing at the court, finding the identity of the woman in the stories is, is particularly significant. So there is just so much happening during this time period mm -hmm. that it's really so difficult to, to really pinpoint what identity means to her. But, but there is... A, a true connection that she has also to the writers of antiquity. She was extremely well read. She knew Ovid. She um, she she transformed many of Aesop's fables. In fact, another one of her works is a work of fables. So she has a real understanding of classical uh, ideas about identity. But they're, they're in transformation now. Uh, an additional thing that's happening during this time period as well is the fascination for history, the history of Arthur. So we have sort of this mythical king and this mythical space. And, and, and during her time, that's when everything is exploding. But she's, she really is very interested in in nature and in gender. Um, she, I mean, obviously not in this particular lay, but um, she's, she's probably one, one of the very few authors from this time period who really, you know, talks about gender bending, <laughs> essentially. So we have a, a, a knight who, who comes in, flies in as a bird, and then takes the shape of his beloved becomes female to be able to convince her that he is, is Christian, that he, he will take the host, etc. So there, there are so many of these events that occur in her lays that really have to do with, with who people are in terms of gender, in, in terms of social status, and in, in terms of, uh, of, of so many other factors. I Thank hope you. that answers yeah, your question absolutely. More somewhat. Than enough. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Interesting you? that you mentioned the classics and yes. Marie being well read in the classics because I was, you know, as you were reciting in English, I was kind of trying to follow. I don't speak French. Obviously, I do not speak Anglo Norman, but with my Latin, kind of trying to follow around, along and see if I could follow it. And something that kind of struck me 
was, um, or something rather, I guess, to introduce this, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I have always enjoyed about reading Latin and all, you know, English poetry and everything is just, like you were talking about, the very precise word choice and all of the meaning that that can have and that kind of like diction. And so what really struck me reading along was um, at the top of the last stanza, there's like kind of, it looks like some parallel structure, there's some repetition. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was just interesting to me. I didn't know if there was like anything to be said about that because I don't know the significance of that because I, I don't know Anglo-Norman. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, so you're, you're saying the repetition between her intro, a set me place de bien veuille, and then what she says again at the end, mm -hmm. the way that she closes. And this is a, a typical structure for Marie's lays. Not all lays have these structures. And again, also the genre of the lay was in transition. So this was a time period where everything was in some ways being shaped. But, uh, but most certainly her her a common structure for her is to introduce herself into the story. She is Marie, she's the one who's saying the truth. She's the one who's presenting this, this evidence that was told and written. Um, and then at the end, she also kind of circles back and reiterates how truthful that is. So uh, this is a, a, a common leitmotif with, um, with Marie, where she, she really harps on the truth of things. And I think at, at, in her time, uh, that was important. Uh, I mean, it's important today. <laughs> but but this, this was really significant for her because of, of how many um, meanings, in many ways, that truth how many forms that truth may take. Um, the fact that she was a woman, and this might be interesting, the fact that she was a woman uh, attracted a lot of criticism to her. But um, what's really interesting is that, um, particularly this one clerk who said, oh, it is just so awful that she's, she's writing these courtly, these, these superfluous stories um, but everybody loves them so much. <laughs> and so there's, there's sort of this sense of the great popularity. And so, um, and so that had become, um, you know, sort of a, a, a real, um, you know, she, she, she was really a, a rock star of, of her time. It's <laughs> very so, interesting. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Other questions? No? Was anybody going to ask why I brought up everything in Anglo-Norman? <sighs> it sounds beautiful. <laughs> it sounds very different from French, you know, from our modern French. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's really just a lovely language. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming today. And um, bonne chance. <laughs> Thank you.